Not just is he amazing and ordered, but he is creative. You see, there's great creativity in creation. As I was reading, even just the description of creation is creative. But look around you at creation. You see creativity in its beauty, in the strange things. Have you ever looked at creation and gone, this is boring. This is so dull. Look at that sunset. Oh, another one, right? Have you ever done that? No, because the very nature of the one who created it is creative. He is beautiful. I want to show you a picture of a few different creative-looking animals. The very first one is called a pink fairy armadillo. Isn't that weird? Look at the creativity. The next one is a maned wolf. Yes, it's a wolf. It looks like a tall fox, right? It's a wolf. Look at the Dumbo octopus. It's super cute. Look, look, look up pictures of these things. They are super cute. Okay? And if you were wondering, is there really creativity in creation? Look at this next one. <laughs> right? I mean, Michael was so happy to have that in there. Of course God is creative if he made that, right? He has to be unique and creative. But I want to show you a few other pictures. I was recently blessed by going to Utah on a hiking trip with my wife and some of our great friends. And I want to show you just some of the creativity that all happened within Zion National Park. Look at the creativity that we see. From just the beautiful landscapes to Bryce Canyon on the right and just the beauty that's there. You can go to the next one. Down in the, in the uh, canyons where we got to walk through the river that's running through all of that cutout area. And you've got the sunlight and then you've got the overview of the whole canyon. I mean the beauty. And it doesn't point to some random chaotic chance. It describes the little bit that we can taste of a creative, beautiful God. I want to point you to Psalm 139. Jot that down in your notes because there's one other great thing about our creator, our creative, intentional God. That intentional God, that creative God, it tells us in Psalm 139 that he made you in his image. It says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. So when it says in Genesis chapter 1 that God created man in his, image, in his own image, he did that intentionally. He knew what he was doing when he wove you together. And maybe you don't understand it. Maybe you're trying to come into sorts with who you are. You won't find who you are outside of God's definition of who you are. God is intentional in your life. God is creative when he made you, and you can know it well. There's one translation of the Bible that says, or summarizes Psalm 139 and says, I am an awesome wonder. Because God created you, you could say that you are an awesome wonder. Because God is supreme. He is the one who created you. I want you to think about the struggle that we all have finding our own identity. And I want you to put that into, into this umbrella, I guess. You will always struggle with who you are if you're trying to find it in anything except God himself, the creator. Which is why studying Genesis and getting to know our creator is so critical because it is, it being what you believe about God the creator. If you don't believe that God created you, if you think that maybe he just got the ball rolling and then chance happened, then it takes away purpose and meaning from your life. And that is not the God that we know. God is intentional. He is ordered. He is creative. And the very things when you look in the mirror or you look at your life and you go, oh man, I'm so weird. I'm so unique. This can't be the result of a, of a smart creator. Yes, it is. That's how creative he is. Because collectively, we all can gather and work worship his name to bring him glory, but we can't do it without each other. And so God is intentional. Warren Wiersbe says this, after all he made you, he planned your potential and ordered your days. This is not some kind of blind fatalism that paralyzes you. It is the wise plan of a loving father who knows what is best for you, 
Accept, accept what you are as his gift to you and then use it wisely as your gift to him. You are unique. God made you that way. There's another commentary from R.C. Sproul on this idea that we are created in the image of God because it's a strange comparison or it's a strange, a strange um, description because God made us out of the dust which separates us from God. We are not God. When you hear we are created in his image, you are not God. You were made from the dust. But you were created in his image, so you are more than the created animals. You bear the image of almighty God, the creator. R.C. Sproul says this, that reflection of the image of God that we are supposed to show is tarnished due to sin. Our ability to mirror his holiness has been greatly affected so that now the mirror is fogged. But we still have a mind, a heart, and a will. We still bear the mark of our creator upon ourselves. The restoration of the fullness of the image of God in human beings is accomplished by Christ. He Christ is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Have you guys ever recognized that you probably give a foggy reflection of Jesus Christ? Yeah. I had a foggy week where it seemed like every time I turned around, there was so much fog on the mirror of reflecting God that I was going, what in the world is my problem? It was a foggy week. I did not reflect the image of God the way that I'm supposed to, in a way that glorified him to his fullest glory. But do you know what helped me? Studying who God is, recognizing that God as Elohim is in charge and supreme over all of it, and I have nothing without him. And so the very power to reflect who Jesus is, the very power to reflect the image of God, who does that come from? Him, because he is supreme over all things. So no matter my failures or my shortcomings or the fogginess in the mirror that's supposed to reflect him, he is the one who overcomes, and that's our next point. As Elohim, he overcomes. You realize that there was nothing, and he spoke, and it all became, because he overcame any darkness, he overcame any nothingness because that's who he is. He overcomes. And he overcomes your weakness and your shortcomings. In Exodus chapter 4, Moses comes to God and he says, God, you must have messed up because I can't talk clearly. You probably screwed up. You should find another messenger. And God looks at Moses and he says, Who's, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute? or deaf, excuse me, who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then, go, and I will be your mouth. Because God, as Elohim, is an overcomer. So you may already be bringing to me, wait, I've got all these things that I'm messed up in. Welcome to the club. Join Moses, join me, join the person next to you, but let's all look to the creator, God, Elohim, as the one who overcomes for his glory. Three more, and I'll go quickly through them. As Elohim, he is delightful. You notice through our reading, through chapter one of Genesis, how many times it said creation was good, and then creation of man was very good. That word good is kind of generic, but here's what it means. It means pleasant, agreeable, sweet, and pleasing. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Do you know why creation could be described as good? Do you know why man could be described as very good? Because God is good. God is delightful. In Psalm 37.4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. How could you delight yourself in the Lord if the Lord himself was not delightful? So this is the God that we worship. This is the God that we praise. The one who is intentional and ordered and creative, but he is so, so good and his creation shows it. John Piper says, all the universe is by comparison to God as nothing. All that we are amazed by in the world, all those pictures that I showed you, 
all the galaxies that are out there compared to God, those things are nothing because that's how beautiful and delightful our God is. They are all just whispers of his infinite glory. We also can see from this creation account in chapter 1 of Genesis that as Elohim, he shows purpose. I mentioned the word intentionality already with order, but purpose is somewhat separate. You might ask the question, why do we exist? Why am I even here? Isaiah 43, 7 answers that. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, whom I formed made. Why are we here? For his glory glory we were created and formed and made doesn't that repetition in that verse show intentionality it shows purpose creation didn't happen by chance you aren't the result of evolution or some randomness you and the world around you were created by a supreme god with the purpose of glorifying him and the more you know about him the more you can glorify him because he is infinite in wonder and majesty. You might ask, okay, so you gave me an answer on why I exist, but why do other things exist? Well, because God, in his intentional order, was designing everything to glorify him. All creation works together in a delicate yet powerful way, and it screams out the greatness and majesty of Elohim. He shows purpose. He shows purpose as we start into chapter 2, I want to read three verses as we close. Chapter 2 says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all of the host of them. We've only covered six days. Let's find out about the seventh. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. What's different about day seven? Work didn't happen, but you notice how that statement that kept reappearing on every other day, morning and evening, that was the first day, the second day, that's not here on day seven. Because God's intent here is to dwell amongst his creation, to be a place where God can rule with his creation in harmony, in peace. And he didn't close that day because that's the, that's the intent that's the intent of what we're supposed to do as created beings, as image bearers of Jesus Christ. We are in harmony, supposed to glorify him. There's no end to that. So day seven is kind of separate and set out. God wants the perfect plan. God's perfect plan is that he rules with his creation in perfect harmony. We see that God shows purpose in everything that he did. And finally... As God, he is sustainer. John Piper says this, everything that is not God totally depends on God. The entire universe, the entire universe is utterly secondary. It came into being by God and it stays in being moment by moment on God's decision to keep it in being. Does anyone else find themselves on autopilot sometimes where you just kind of go through life? Maybe a few hours go by, a few days go by, a few weeks go by, and you really haven't recognized God as the supreme being. You realize that every step, every breath, every animal, every wind, every sunshine, every rain is sustained and kept going by Almighty God. It is his choice, and if at any moment he withdrew his hand, it would cease, because God and God alone is the sustainer. Not chaos, not science, not anything that you can rationalize in your head. It is God, and it is God alone as the sustainer. And since God does and is all of this, and he is the perfection of all of it, then how do we need to apply it differently? There is so much in that reading. There is so much in the first five words of what we read to define who God is, to show us the nature of God. And it can be so overwhelming. So what I want you to do right now, instead of trying to take the last 35 minutes of what you've learned and try to jam it all in your head so that you remember it, 
I want you to think of one thing that stood out to you. What is one characteristic of God where you went, that's really meaningful to me right now? And I want you to circle it or write it down in your notes or text it to yourself so that you remember. Or maybe there was a fact that stood out to you today. Maybe it was all the way at the beginning when I went through the facts of the name Elohim. I want you to write that fact down and I want you to ask, why did that, why did that fact resonate with me? And I want you to take that before our almighty God and I want you to remember this process that the Lord has us through of learning and how to glorify him more effectively. So I want you to do one of those two things. If the most important thing about you is what comes to mind when you think about God, then make sure that when you think about him, it's the truth that comes to mind. It's the majesty of who he is as the supreme one beyond full comprehension. Would you pray with me? Father, we bow ourselves before you, the Supreme One, Elohim. We have so many different things on our minds. We have so many different distractions. We have so much information available to us, and so much of it is untrue. So much of it is biased. So much of it tries to rationalize and make sense of all the different things that we see. But Lord, there is but one truth, and that truth comes from you. I pray this morning that as we, as we worship you, that what comes to our mind is not a person's definition of God, that what comes to mind is not someone else's definition of God, but what comes to mind is the truth of who you actually are as God. You are the supreme one. You are the one who created all things with no help from anyone else. And part of that creation was that you, God, created me. You created me. You didn't mess up. You didn't make a mistake. You are ordered and creative and you are intentional and with purpose. And because I know that you created me, I too have purpose and meaning. And primarily that meaning is to glorify you. And so, Lord, we gather in harmony this morning, recognizing that you, God, are the one that we worship. And I thank you for this time together.